All right, and thank you very much, Jen. And um, as he said, you know, I, I first uh, did my master's degree in uh, second language teaching and learning. And when I was doing that research for my master's degree, I studied about language comprehension. Then when I did my PhD, I was uh, studying visual perception and eye movements. And I have wanted to bring those interests back together, comprehension and perception. And that's what I'm talking about today, uh, is how perception and comprehension uh, work together. And what's the influence of comprehension on perception uh, when you're watching a movie? Um, and so, yeah, so uh, my talk is how is a movie viewer's understanding related to how they watch a movie? And before I start, I just want to briefly um, mention my collaborators on this research. So uh, I have uh, both uh, a current graduate student and a former graduate student. My former graduate student who's worked on this with me uh, is Dr. Adam Larson. He's now at the University of Findlay in Ohio, and um, he's been there uh, long enough, I think he's just about to get tenure. Uh, and then uh, John Hudson, he's one of my current graduate students, and he's just about to finish his PhD, and he's worked on this as well. And then I have two uh, main colleagues uh, at other universities that I've been collaborating with on this. One of them is uh, Dr. Joe Magliano, who's at Northern Illinois University. Uh, and the other one is uh, Dr. Tim Smith at the Birkbeck University of London. So uh, all of these studies have been done, that I'll be talking about, uh, were done with these people. So I wanted to <coughs> mention them. Okay, so does a movie viewer's understanding affect how they watch a movie? Well, um, perceiving and understanding movies seems to be very easy for us. Uh, you know, most people, they just watch movies and it seems to be completely effortless. Uh, but how do we do it? This is a question that is not so easy to answer. It's a, actually a very complicated question. And I want to ask uh, a question that is uh, of great interest, I think, to film scholars which is, does each viewer understand and watch a movie in the same way or differently? Um, and so to start off with that idea, that uh, question, I'm gonna uh, give two opposing quotes from two film directors, Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino. So let me start with Spielberg. He said, uh, all of us go into a kind of a lockstep where if we were watching a tennis match, you'd see that perfect synchronicity of heads going left, right, left, right. The same thing in a movie theater. When the movie is working and the audience is galvanized, almost hypnotized, all watching the same things, all knowing where to look at the exact same time, it's a wonderful thing. There's nothing greater than that. So Spielberg here is talking about the film director having uh, great control over the uh, audience so that the audience, they're all looking left and right at the same time and they all know exactly when to look, okay? And he's saying this is a really wonderful thing for a filmmaker, okay? And then we have a quote from Quentin Tarantino, and he said, if a million people see my movie, I hope they see a million different movies. Okay, so basically he's saying he hopes that every viewer who sees his movie sees his movie differently. Okay, so these are very different opposing opinions from two very famous directors. Uh, Spielberg basically talking about the director controlling the uh, understanding and the perception of the viewer. And Quentin Tar Tarantino basically saying he wants the viewer, to, all the viewers to be completely different and have very different understandings and perceptions of his movies. So, uh, well, 
Obviously, different people can have very different understandings of a movie. Anybody who is interested in film knows this, okay? Um, and I'm actually going to show evidence of that in my talk. We'll actually be measuring people's understanding and show that they're very different, okay? But does our understanding affect how we look at movies when we watch them, okay? And this is going to get at, when I say look at, I mean really like uh, people's eye movements. Where do they look, okay? Uh, now for film, we don't really know the answer to this question, except from the studies that I'm gonna be reporting, okay? Uh, but we do know for reading. For reading, we know that a person, we do know that um, when we read, our understanding affects our eye movements, okay? So um, for people who are not accustomed to uh, talking about or thinking about eye movements, let me define eye movements first. So we have our little eye icon here, and let's say there's something interesting to look at somewhere else, and so the eye is going to move to those interesting things to look at them, and when the eye moves, we're gonna call that a saccade, okay? And that's French for jump, because the eyes tend to jump very quickly, okay? And when the eyes get there, when they have finished their saccade, and then they stop moving, and they take in information from that thing of interest, we're gonna call that a fixation, okay? It means staying in one place, okay? So when we're in a fixation, that is when we are actually processing the information there, not during the saccade. But the saccade tells us where somebody's attention went. What are they interested in? What are they paying attention to? We can tell that by the saccades, okay? All right, so uh, readers' understanding affects their eye movements. And let me give you an example. I'll give you an example sentence. It's a simple sentence, but it's a little bit confusing, okay? So the bushes were planted by the greenhouse yesterday, okay? This seems like a very simple sentence, but actually it's a little bit tricky because when you read the bushes were planted by, we automatically think they were planted by a person. So for example, the bushes were planted by the gardener, okay? But then we get the bushes were planted by the greenhouse. A greenhouse is a place where you put bushes or you put plants, okay? So a greenhouse cannot plant plants, right? So, uh, but that means that actually planted by means they were planted near the greenhouse, okay? So this could cause some confusion. And when we look at people's eye movements, they show us that confusion. So here's an example, uh, okay? So when the person is uh, making eye movements to read this, okay, when they have confusion, that leads to longer fixations, okay? So the eye will stay at the confusing place longer, okay? And I'm sure you've recognized that yourself when you're reading and you come across a word that you don't understand, you look at it longer, okay? That's a longer fixation. It also leads to looking backwards. Okay, those are called regressive saccades. Okay, so you make a saccade in the reverse direction. Okay. Until you understand what's going on. Okay, so our eyes will tend to move from right to left if you're reading in English, but if you have a, something that you're confused by, then you will go back, and then when you understand, you will go forward again. Okay, so these are ways that comprehension or understanding affect eye movements in reading, okay? All right, but what about movie viewers' eye movements, okay? And that's a topic that we don't know because uh, no previous research has asked this question, okay? So uh, part of the reason why no, no previous research has asked this question is because of what I would call the compartmentalization. That's a long word, but it means uh, the separation, the separation into different groups of research on film perception 
and film comprehension. Okay? So there's no integrative theory that can explain both film perception and film comprehension. Okay? And that's because uh, there are separate areas of research that have been done, and they don't tend, the people in these areas of research tend not to talk to each other very much. Okay? And so these three areas of research are scene perception. So in scene perception, people study perception of scenes, so like a photograph or a video of this room right now. We could show that to somebody and we could flash it and ask them, what is it? And they could say, it's a classroom and uh, identify that very quickly. That would be scene perception. Or show them this uh, photograph of this room and, and measure their eye movements and see what they pay attention to, what they look at, or what they remember. Okay? These are all things in scene perception. Okay? Then there's another area called event perception. So if I show somebody um, a movie of a video of this lecture and uh, then you see different parts of the lecture. For example, when Dr. Psyche was doing my introduction and then when I start talking, these are different parts and so we would segment it, okay? But those, are, those parts are in our mind. It's not in the reality, but uh, we perceive uh, events as having, we perceive reality as being in chunks. And that affects our memory. So that's event perception research. And then lastly, discourse comprehension or text comprehension or reading comprehension. Okay, so uh, people have done a lot of research on reading comprehension and uh, a very small number of people have also taken those ideas and applied them to film. One of the only people to do that is my friend Joe Magliano who's working with me on this project who I mentioned. Okay, but people doing research in these three areas hardly ever talk together. Uh, some of the only people doing that are me, because I'm in scene perception, talking with Joe Magliano, who does uh, discourse comprehension and event perception research. So there's no theory that puts all this together. So uh, I have come up with the theory, and I've been working on it with Joe Magliano and Tim Smith, and Adam Larson, and now John Hudson. And it's called the Scene Perception and Event Comprehension Theory, or SPECT, SPECT. Okay? And there's a lot of stuff going on in this. It looks very complicated, but actually, if you look at all the parts and you take it apart, it's actually not so complicated, uh, considering that it's trying to explain a lot of things perception and comprehension. Uh, but I'm going to just go over it very briefly. So we start with the stimulus. So in this case, it's going to be a movie. Okay? And then we have what we call the front end. And these are things, the front end are processes, mental processes that happen during single eye fixations. So that's why we have this little eye icon here. Okay? These are single eye fixations. And then we have what we call the back end, and those are things, those are processes that are going on in memory, okay? In memory, not in perception, but in memory. And uh, those, we have short-term memory, or working memory, as we call it, and we also have long-term memory, okay? So in my talk today, I'm going to talk about the front end, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about attentional selection. So on every eye fixation, the brain is taking an information, that's what we call information extraction, and the brain decides where the eyes will go next. Before the eyes move, the brain decides where to go. And that's what we call attentional selection, and that's why we have an arrow from one eye to the next, because uh, in between this fixation and then when I decide to make the next fixation, my brain decides, and then my eyes go there, okay? And I'm going to talk about the back end, and specifically I'm going to be talking about what we call the current event model. The current event model, a simple way of saying that is your understanding of what you are seeing now. Like all of you have a current event model 
uh, for this event, the, the lecture I'm giving, and you have an idea, an understanding of this lecture. Okay, that's your current event model for this lecture. Okay, and we say that there's three main processes. Laying the foundation for the current event model, that is, at the very beginning of a new event, you have to understand, what is this event? And once you have a rough idea, a very general rough idea of what the event is, for example, this is a lecture, okay, you have that idea, that's, you have laid the foundation. And then the next step is mapping incoming information. So after you have a rough idea of the event, as new information comes in through your eyes during the fixations, you add that new information to the event model. We call that mapping incoming information. And then at the end of the event, you uh, stop processing that event, you put it in long-term memory for later, and then you start a brand new event. And so you start the whole process over again, and that's called shifting. Okay, so uh, I'm mostly gonna be talking about mapping incoming information. In the middle of an event, as you take in new information, and add it to your understanding of what's going on now, okay? And what my question is, is does this mapping of incoming information in the current event model affect attentional selection? And so that's a very technical way of asking the question, how does understanding of a movie affect perception of the movie or eye movements in the movie? Okay, so, so I'm going to be talking about these questions that I just told you uh, that, have been, that have come from SPECT and that we have tested these questions already, and I'm going to give you the results. Okay, so we're asking about does the back end in memory and understanding affect the front end, the attention and eye movements? So does constructing the current event model, our understanding, influence attentional selection, our eye movements, in film. So what is the relationship between eye movements and film comprehension so far from previous research that we know of? There's not very much. But we do know that movie viewers show strong attentional synchrony. Attentional synchrony is basically this. So here's a uh, still from, uh, does anybody know what movie this came from? Blade Runner, very good. Yeah, so this is from Blade Runner. It's one still, and at this moment, we, each of these circles is a different person's eye fixation, okay? And what we see is all these different people are all looking at more or less the same place. And because this is a still, that is one point in time. So all these people are looking mostly at the same place at the same time. That is what we call attentional synchrony. Okay, synchrony is same time. So attention at the same time. Okay, all right. And so uh, we have this attentional synchrony and it has led us to what we are calling the tyranny of film. Okay, so what is the tyranny of film? Tyranny, by the way, is, uh, let's see, asan, asse, asse. Right, okay, so ega no asse, all right? The tyranny of film, but what is that really? Well, if everyone looks at the same places at the same time, okay, then there should be no chance to find differences in eye movements that are caused by differences in film comprehension. So if two people have two different understandings of the film, but they all look at the same places at the same time, then their eye movements are not gonna show differences of understanding. Does that make sense? So that's what we're calling the tyranny of film. All right. Now, understanding a film requires us to interpret thousands of shots. So a typical movie these days has a new shot every two or three seconds, okay? And if you have uh, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and two hours for a movie, you end up with thousands of shots, okay? So to understand the movie, you have to put all those shots together. 
And to create understanding across the shots, which we call coherence, that is to uh, make sense across those shots, okay, we have to interpret the rules of film editing. Okay? So let me give you an example of that. I'm going to show you six shots from a James Bond moon, uh, movie called Moonraker. Okay. Okay, and having watched that, now I want you to tell me, what do you think will happen next? Anybody have an idea? So the guy go down on the tent. Okay, the guy that we saw falling through the air will fall on the circus tent. How many of you think so? Most of you. And that's correct. That is, this, that is the next thing that is shown in this film. Okay? All right. So what that means is you have a good understanding. Okay? You just watch a film clip. There was no words, no sound, and yet you were able to make a prediction that was correct. So your understanding is good. This is a very important point. And so that's called making an inference. You made an inference. You didn't have the information yet, but you were able to guess. You were able to predict what would happen next. Okay, all right, so we had six shots, okay, in shots one, two, and three. In shot one, you see the guy pull his ripcord and it breaks and uh, his parachute does not come out and he is in shock and then he starts reacting to it. And then we have a very interesting thing in shot four, <laughs> something different is happening. Okay, we have what's called a cross-cutting sequence. Okay, so all shots one, two, and three are the same guy. But now we see a circus tent in shot four. Very different. It's a very different place. Okay, but then in shot five we see the guy again. But then in shot six we see the inside of a circus tent. Okay, so we're going guy, circus tent, guy, circus tent. That's called cross-cutting. Okay. So this cross-cutting sequence creates a puzzle for the viewer, the movie viewer. They have to try to understand why are they being shown two different sets of things at different places. Okay? And this cross-cutting is a technique of film editing and uh, in it the film editor is trying to show that these two things that are being cross-cut are going to come together in one place and one time. Not always, but oftentimes that's what happens. And so that helps us to make the inference that this guy who's falling through the air is probably going to fall on this circus tent. It'll come together at the same place in time. Okay. All right. And so at the end of showing this, then we ask people what will happen next. And just like you guys, most people think that Jaws, or the guy, will fall in the circus tent. And that was shown in a study by Joe Magliano uh, back in 1996. And so, uh, based on this, that was a very nice example of drawing a predictive inference. Uh, because people will do it, almost everybody will do it. Okay? And it's an inference and it shows comprehension. So we decided to do a study with it. And uh, so this is our case study number one experimental case study, I should say, using the James Bond Moonraker clip. And uh, it's reported in this paper. And we thought that it's a case study because we only have one film clip, so it's a case study. But it was an ideal film clip for our purposes uh, because it's a Hollywood movie and so uh, it should produce very strong attentional synchrony. Okay. And we know, based on Joe Magliano's research, that uh, there's this predictive inference that people need to make what's going to happen next, that the guy's going to fall in the circus tent. And it requires higher level comprehension processes. Okay? So it's not simple comprehension to actually predict what's going to happen before you see it. 
So in our experiment, we used a new method that we created and we called it the jumped in the middle paradigm. The jumped in the middle paradigm is like when you're at home and let's say your friend or family member is sitting on the couch watching a TV show or a movie. And then you come in and you sit down next to them and you start watching the movie with them. Okay? But they watched it from the beginning. You jumped into the movie in the middle. Okay? So when you and your friend are both sitting there watching the same thing on the screen at the same time, your understandings will be very different. Your friend will have a much better understanding than you because your friend was watching it from the beginning. So this is how we could manipulate understanding, even though it's exactly the same thing. Even though they're, they're watching exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Okay? So we had two groups. We call the no context group. They only watch the, those 12 seconds I just showed you. Okay? And then the context group started watching it earlier. They watched the preceding three minutes and eight seconds of the movie. Okay? So they had more context. All right? And so what we're doing is we're manipulating the event model. The event model is your understanding of what is happening now. Okay? But we're leaving the stimulus, that's the movie clip, exactly the same. Okay? All right. So in that paper that's right here, we had three experiments using this jumped in the middle uh, paradigm or method. Okay? In experiment one, uh, we showed people the movie clips, uh, the context and no context, and then after every shot, we stopped the movie and we gave them a text box and they had to write their understanding of the story at that moment. Okay, so we call this think aloud. In experiment two, we had event segmentation. So we showed them the, the video clips and then uh, either context or no context. We said, press a button anytime you think something new happened. So that's called event segmentation. And then uh, if we look at the results from experiments one and two, what we found was that the context condition had much better understanding. Okay. Uh, and so, number one, there was a big difference. They, the people in the context condition were uh, about twice as likely to predict that the guy would fall in the circus tent. Okay? So that's the key inference. And they were more likely to perceive coherence across the cu cross-cutting theme. To them, the cross-cutting between the guy falling and the circus tent made sense. But to the people in the no-context condition, it didn't make as much sense. They were wondering, why am I seeing a circus tent? Okay. Then in experiment three, we measured the eye movements. Okay. So uh, let me tell you about the eye movements. So we had 176 uh, people watching it. So we had 87 people in every condition, in both conditions. Okay. They watched the clip while their eyes were tracked, and at the end, we asked them, some questions, like, what do you think will happen next? Okay, and our key question was, will the attentional synchrony eliminate the effects of comprehension on eye movements? And so the measures we used, we had the inference. So did they mention the guy uh, falling on the circus tent, yes or no? <coughs> and so uh, when we asked them what will happen next, in the context condition, 91% of the people said he's, the guy's going to fall in the circus tent. They made the inference. Uh, but in the no context condition, only 71% did. So that's a pretty big difference. Okay. And then what that enabled us to do is we could divide our eye movement data, this EM means eye movement, by whether they did or they did not make the inference. And then we also measured attentional synchrony. So we did that with eye movement similarity. OK. So, and so our hypotheses that we compared for attentional synchrony, we had two uh, alternative hypotheses. And actually, well, we had the tyranny of film hypothesis that said there's no differences. 
in eye movements due to comprehension differences. Because everybody's looking at the same place at the same time, their eye movements cannot be different even if they have different understanding. But then we had the event model hypothesis, and we actually had two alternatives of this. Okay? So the event model hypothesis says your event model will influence your eye movements. But it could do that in two different ways. Uh, you, if you have a better event model, then you could pay attention to important information. And if you do that, then you'll have more attentional synchrony. So people who have a better understanding will look in the same place because they're looking at the important stuff. But alternatively, if you have a worse event model, you might pay attention to very visually salient things, like things that are moving, things that are brighter, things that are more colorful, then maybe people will just look at those, even though they don't understand the story, but they'll just look at big, bright, moving things. Okay? In which case, they might have more attentional synchrony. Okay? Just because they don't understand, they're just looking at stuff. Okay? So it could go either way. All right, so let's look at global attentional synchrony. So I'm going to show you the three conditions. We have no context, and they did not draw the inference. They did not, th they did not say that the guy's going to fall in the circus tent. And then we have no context, but they did draw the inference. Okay, So they didn't have the context, like you guys didn't have the context, but most of you drew the inference. Okay, So that would be this group. And then we have the context group that did draw the inference. And that's almost all of them. Okay? So I'm going to show you. These colors are the, uh, the colors that you see here and the little circles. That's where people are looking. Okay? So brighter color means more people looking. All right? And these are, you can see lots and lots of little circles. Okay? That's where the people were looking at that time. And so, oh, there we go. All right. So what do you think? Do they look the same or different? Globally, they're very similar. Yeah? They're pretty much all around the same places. Okay? They're pretty much looking at the same things at the same time. Okay? So this would be support for the tyranny of film. Even though they have different understandings, for example, uh, these people did not draw the inference, and these people did draw the inference. And yet they're looking at the same places at the same time. However, if we do a much more detailed analysis, we do find some differences, small differences. Okay, so here we're going to look at the attentional synchrony, the gaze similarity, or eye movement similarity, on a frame by frame basis. So this is all the frames in that 12 second shot. Each frame has its own analysis. Okay, and here what we have is the no context who did not draw the inference, the no context who did draw the inference, Here's the context group in green who did draw the inference. And then this is the context group shuffled. The shuffled means we mixed it all up and we wanted to find what is the random chance level of gaze similarity when you mix them all up. Okay? So that will tell us like what is the bottom line, the minimum amount of gaze similarity. Okay? And so this is the minimum amount of gaze similarity. Okay? And uh, the key thing was in shot four. Shot four is the beginning of the cross-cutting sequence. It's the first shot where they see the circus tent. Okay? And they have to try to understand, why am I seeing a circus tent? And some people, uh, in the context condition especially, as soon as they saw the circus tent and we asked them to think aloud, they said, the guy's going to fall in the circus tent. Okay? But not so many people did that in the uh, no context condition. Half as many. Okay? This is shot four. And notice, here's the green. And this is higher 
than the red and the blue. Okay, so these are, uh, th these are the context group who made the inference, and they have higher gaze similarity. So that was our hypothesis that the mental model, if you had a better understanding, you'll look at the important things and you will look at the same important things so you will have higher gaze similarity. And if we look here, you can see this is the context group that drew the inference. This is smaller than this. This is a little bit more spread out. That's the difference. Okay. So this is a real significant, statistically significant difference. On the other hand, it is small, okay? So from this uh, experimental case study, uh, what we see, what we can conclude is we have strong attentional synchrony in a Hollywood film, and it can easily hide large differences in understanding. So we had big differences in understanding between the people who knew that the guy is going to fall in the circus tent and those who did not. But we're only finding very small differences in eye movements. And this is consistent with the tyranny of film hypothesis. Okay. On the other hand, we are finding these subtle differences in eye movements based on understanding. They are real. We are finding real differences, but they're small and subtle. Okay. And so that's uh, some evidence for the event model having an impact on attention. Okay, so this led us to raise a question. Can we increase the effect of the event model on eye movements? Okay, and so we thought if we want to increase the effect of the event model, we need to decrease the attentional synchrony that is caused by the movie stimulus. <coughs> okay, and the Moonraker clip had a lot of cuts. It had six shots in 12 seconds. So basically, one cut every two seconds. Okay? And we know that there is actually increased attentional synchrony at cuts. And let me quickly go back here and show you that. It, these red, line, red dotted lines are all of the cuts. Okay, and you notice that after the cut, the gaze similarity goes down and then it jumps up. And then here, down, jumps up. And then a little jump up, here we have it jumps up, and then down, jumps up. The reason that happens is because anytime there's a cut, people immediately, wherever their eye is, they send their eye to the middle of the screen. That's why you get an increase in attentional synchrony when there's a cut, okay? But that doesn't mean that they're really understanding it. It's just whenever the, everything on the, on the screen changes, they send their eyes to the middle of the screen. All right, so uh, it had many cuts, and this increased the attentional synchrony at the cuts. Okay. Also, in the Moonraker clip, we always had one thing to look at. Usually, it's either, it's either the falling man or it's the circus tent and it's pretty much in the middle of the screen, okay? So that would also increase attentional synchrony because there's only one thing to look at, okay? So what we need is a film clip with no cuts, just one shot, and many different things to look at, okay? Then we can get more, we can have less attentional synchrony, so maybe less tyranny of film, and then more effect of the event model. And so we picked a very famous film uh, shot from Touch of Evil by Orson Welles. Okay? So it's a very famous shot in which uh, it's a three minute and 30 second shot. Okay, no cuts. And here it is, and I will show it to you. So the guy put the bomb in the car. The couple who own the car don't know about the bomb. They get in the bomb in the car. OK. 
Okay, and then, I'm not gonna show you all of this, but they drive, you see them driving through the streets. And then, right about middle through, we see this couple right here who are walking. And the car passes them. And then we see them continue to walk. And they walk past the car. And the car starts to come back out again. And they keep walking and driving. And then they stop here at a, uh, this is a border crossing between Mexico and the United States. They're both there together. The walking couple and the couple in the car. The walking couple walks away. The couple in the car drives off. And then we see the walking couple kiss. And that's the end of that shot. And then we ask, what will happen next? So what do you think will happen next? The car will explode. The car will explode. How many of you think so? OK. Most people think that, and that is the correct answer. The, uh, the very next shot is the car exploding. Okay, so that means, again, you guys have very good understanding of this film at a high level. Okay, you have a good event model for what's happening in the story, even though there was no words. Okay, so we have experimental case study number two, using the Touch of Evil film clip. And now this is uh, from this paper that just came out last year with John Hudson is the lead author on that. Okay, and so we tested the same two main alternative competing hypotheses. Uh, the event model hypothesis, that the event model directs eye movements, and the tyranny of film hypothesis, that everybody looks at the same places at the same time, so there's no chance for the mental model or event model to direct eye movements. And we use that opening shot. And um, by the way, how do you think that the event model might change eye movements. If the, if the event model is going to direct people's attention, um, well, I'll, I'll actually, let me uh, hold that question for just a moment. And let's look at the uh, use of the jumped in the middle paradigm again. Okay, and this time in the context condition, they see the movie from the very beginning, they see the bomb, and they see everything afterwards. But in the no context condition, they don't see that. They start watching the movie when the walking couple is by themselves on the street. Okay? They didn't see the car, they didn't see the bomb. Okay? So uh, the bomb is only seen by the people in the context condition, and the walking couple in the no context condition are treated as the protagonists or the agents, the, thing, the people who are doing things that are important, okay? So um, when we ask them what will happen next, you can guess people in the context condition are much more likely to talk about the bomb exploding and not the people in the no context condition. They're more likely to say something like, well, I think that the, uh, the walking couple maybe will have dinner with the people in the car the couple in the car. That's a very different understanding, very different event model. Okay, so what differences might we find in eye movements? How about for the people who know about the bomb? How might that affect their eye movements? They'll pay more attention on the car. Right, why? Because we know, well, we, we may we think that the would explode. Right, exactly. So if you know about the bomb, you're probably going to look at the car a lot more, right? Because every time you see the car, you're thinking, oh my god, is it going to explode? Is it going to kill the walking couple too? Is it going to kill other people, right? If you don't know about the bomb, who cares about the car, right? And especially if you treat this 
walking couple as the protagonists, you don't even know about the people in the car. So they're not important to you. Okay? All right. So for our experiment, uh, we had 193 viewers, so we had 96 viewers per condition. Okay? And they watch the clip while their eyes are tracked and they answer the questions at the end, like what will happen next. And our key question was, will attentional synchrony eliminate the effects of comprehension on eye movements? Our measures, we had the inference, did they mention the bomb? When we asked them the question, what will happen next? And uh, in the context condition, 50% made the inference. So half of the people in the context condition said something about the bomb. Okay, the other half did not. We think this is because this was a three minute and 30 second film clip and you only see the bomb at the very beginning. And then you don't have any reminder of the bomb for the rest of that film clip. So some people, they're seeing all this other stuff and they, they seem to forget about the bomb. How about sound? Did you, did you allow them to hear the sound? Because there is ticking noise. Actually, there's no ticking noise, but, well, there is at the beginning. There is at the beginning. You're right. And then the woman in the car says that there's this ticking noise in my head. Exactly. Like that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So in the first experiment, which I'm not showing you, we had the sound. And uh, in the second experiment, we didn't have sound because we didn't want to remind people if they forgot about the bomb, and then they heard the woman say, there's this ticking noise in my head then they might be like, oh yeah, the bomb. And, but if they had forgotten about it, then their eye movements would not have been influenced by it. But then if they remember it, right before the end, they might say, yes, I think the bomb's gonna explode. And that would mess up our analysis. So, um, and we did actually do another experiment where we found, uh, we measured people's working memory, that is their short-term memory. And the people who had, uh, the people who, said something about the bomb at the end, who saw the bomb, had higher working memory or higher short-term memory than the people who saw the bomb but didn't mention it. So we do think that they probably forgot. That's, I think, why the other 50% did not say it. Uh, and then in the no context condition, 0% did. Nobody said it. So that's a big difference in comprehension. It's not surprising, but we just wanted to have a big difference in comprehension. And then we can see what happens to the eye movements. And so with the eye movement data, again, we will break it down by if they did or did not make the inference. And then we also will look at fixation durations. And that will tell us in reading, if you are reading and you don't understand a word, you look at it longer. Okay, so your fixation duration is longer. So that can tell us if they're having a hard time understanding or easy time understanding. And then attentional synchrony, and then also attention, eye fixations to the car, which is what uh, was just mentioned. Okay, that could be a big difference. So, uh, let's look at the fixation durations first. This is the no context. Here's the context who did not make the inference, and here's the context who did make the inference. And here is how long the fixation durations were in milliseconds. And we see there's a difference here between no context and the context who made the inference. Okay? So uh, basically what this is showing is the people who didn't have the context are having a harder time processing the movie clip than the people who did. Okay. And now we have the gaze similarity, and I showed you the same thing in the previous experiment, so you now have an idea of what this is. So here's the gaze similarity. This is over time in the movie. And we have the groups, context who made the inference, context who did not make the inference, no context, and then the random, this is the random baseline. Okay? And what we see is, if we look at this, it's going up and down, but the colors aren't very differentiated here. Okay, so basically, we have similar levels of attentional synchrony. Uh, but all of them were higher than the shuffled random baseline. So this is much lower. So this is real attentional synchrony. It's not random, but it's not differing between the context and no context groups. Or 
if they did or did not make the inference. Okay? So their understanding is not changing their attentional synchrony. Okay? And now here, this is the proportion of car fixations. So we measured how often they fixated the car. And this is from the beginning of the video to the end. This is the very beginning when the uh, con no context group started to watch the movie. And uh, if you compare over this whole time period, you can see that they're very similar. Okay, so there was no difference. It was not different. Okay, so overall we had no difference in the fixations of the car. However, there was a small difference. And that is uh, right here, the first eight seconds when the car first appeared for the people in the no context group. And so uh, right there, we actually are finding a difference where in the no context group, they're not looking at the car very much. Okay, that was when the car was parked and the walking couple walked past it. Okay, they didn't, the people in the no context group, to them, that's just background. So they don't really pay much attention to it. But the people who'd been watching from the beginning, who knew about the bomb, and also treated the people in the car as protagonists, they are watching it much more. Okay, so, uh, and so we call that the agent effect. Okay, an agent is somebody who does things. Okay, and they're treating the people in the car as agents rather than as background. Okay. So, all right. So, the effects of comprehension on eye movements in film are small. Okay. We've shown, again, a small effect. Okay. And this led us to a question Can we find a stronger effect of cognition or thinking? on eye movements in film by using an explicit task. Okay, so um, if we give them something to do, okay, when we show them the, the video, we didn't tell them to do anything. They're just watching it and just trying to comprehend it because they want to, okay? Uh, so we gave them a map drawing task like this, okay? So we had a new group of participants and we said, all right, we're going to show you a video clip, and in this video clip, you're going to see people going through a city at night, and you're going to see different places, and we want you to, uh, after you finish watching the video clip, we're going to give you a piece of paper and ask you to draw a map of all the places that you saw in the video clip, and we want you to be able to label as many of those places as possible, okay? And we will grade you for your accuracy how well you could do. And we did do that, okay? And notice that this task is at odds with comprehending the story. At odds with means competing with, okay? This task is competing with understanding the story. That is, if you're trying to uh, pay attention to all the locations so you can draw a map of it from memory, you are probably not paying attention to the story. Okay, so, uh, so we had 75 new viewers who only did the map task, and uh, we compared them to the context group that made the inference, and we're going to now call that the comprehension group. Okay, so these are the people who, were, who knew about the bomb, and they made the inference, so they understood it well. Okay, all right, and then they both saw the whole clip. Okay, and then after it, the people in the map task, they had to draw the map of, with as many uh, locations and names as possible. And our measures are the same as the last experiment. And for our data analysis, we first scored the maps. We actually, we used a computer program called the Gardoni Map Analyzer, and this actually was able to uh, say uh, which maps were better maps and which maps were worse maps. I won't explain the whole thing, but it works very well. Um, and so uh, basically, then what we did is we took the top half 
We took the, uh, out of the 75, we picked the 37 who had the best MAP scores because we assumed these people really were doing the task. They were doing the MAP task because they were in the top 50%, okay? Because some of our participants, at the end, we gave them the paper and they said, what's that? And we're like, you're supposed to draw the map. They're like, oh, I forgot. So we didn't want them, we didn't want to compare them because they're not doing the task. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, interestingly, oh, and also, we only picked the ones who did not make the inference. And basically, only 18% of the participants uh, made the inference in the map task. Okay. So they were not comprehending the story very well, okay? All right, so here is proportion of car fixations, and here's the time, and now we have the two groups, the comprehension group and the map task group. And what you can see is now we have a big effect, okay? So the people in the map task group are looking at the car a lot less than the people in the comprehension group. Okay, here's a huge difference, okay, and we have other differences here. And so when you put it all together for this whole time period, it was a big difference, okay? So we are getting differences due to, under, not understanding the story, but due to cognition, due to thinking, okay? All right, and notice that this task, again, is at odds with comprehension. Okay, so a task that's going against understanding the film is having a bigger effect on attention than the comprehension of the film. Okay, so here are some questions uh, that we have tested. Uh, and this comes from SPECT. What's the effect of the back end on the front end? So does constructing the current event model influence attentional selection in film? And what we've seen is it only does a little bit, just a little bit, okay? Um, there are small differences in gaze similarity due to the inference in the James Bond Moonraker. We saw the small difference there. And we found the small difference in the first looks at the car in the touch of evil, what we call the agent effect. So we found the small difference there, okay? Uh, but we found a much bigger effect of goal-driven executive attention. Executive attention is when you are deciding where you're going to pay attention. For example, if you want to be a careful driver and when you come up to an intersection and uh, you don't have to stop, but if there's no stop sign, but maybe you carefully pay attention to look both ways, that is executive attention. Okay, and that's what they're doing with the map task. This has a much stronger effect on eye movements in film. So if we go back to the model and we say, what is this effect of the uh, current event model and mapping incoming information on the front end process of attentional selection, what we can say is uh, that uh, in these two studies, we find a weak effect Okay, we only find a weak effect of the event model, uh, but probably a much bigger effect of visual saliency. That is, things that pop out, stuff in the movie that are brighter or moving or uh, somehow different and that captures your eyes. Okay, uh, and also the executive processes, attentional control and goal setting. This seems to have a much bigger effect. Okay, in our two uh, experimental case studies. All right, so I have a few remaining questions. Uh, and so are our results replicable and generalizable? Okay, so that is, uh, could other people get the same results that we have gotten? Do our results with our two experimental case studies, are they actually representing reality? Okay, will other people find the same results? Well, we did get the same general results in two experimental case studies, and those are using two very different clips. Okay, the James Bond Moonraker had uh, one shot every two seconds. 
the Touch of Evil had no cuts. It was all one long shot for three minutes and 30 seconds. And the Touch of Evil had many things to look at, okay? Uh, but we still got similar results. However, future studies that use many different video clips would be even better. On the other hand, if you look at the very small number of other studies that have looked at something kind of similar, okay, eye movement studies with film or video, their results are actually uh, suggesting the same results that we got, the tyranny of film. And let me tell you, there's only two studies I know of that can fit that. Um, one is by Wang et al. And what they did is they took a bunch of film clips that were long shots, okay? And then uh, what they did was they either showed people the normal film clip with no cuts, and they tracked their eyes, or they divided it up into small sections, small shots. And then they shuffled, they randomized the uh, order, okay? And obviously, when you're watching a film clip and it has been cut up into little bits and then shuffled, your understanding will have to be a lot worse, okay? And other studies have shown that. They didn't measure that in this study, but we know it's gonna be a lot worse, okay? But their eye movements, the only differences they found in eye movements were at the cuts. Remember how I showed you, whenever there's a cut, people will move their eyes to the center of the screen and that creates an increase in attentional synchrony for a brief moment, okay? Do you guys remember that? Like in the James Bond, uh, every time there's a cut, the, the, uh, first the attentional synchrony goes down, then it goes up because everybody looks at the center, okay? That's the only effect that they had on eye movements, okay? So that suggests not much effect of understanding, okay? And then there's another uh, newer study that just came out last year, Huff et al. And they, had a, they showed people a soccer match. It was live, a live soccer match in Germany. Uh, and they had two teams that are arch rivals. These teams hate each other, okay? And uh, so they had the fans of the two teams watching and they did eye movement measures, okay? And what they found was, they did find differences in judgments of which team contributed more to the game. So the, both team, both, the fans of both teams thought that their team contributed more to the game, okay? But they found no differences in the eye movements at all, okay? So uh, basically, these uh, results suggest that we may find that our tyranny of film result is uh, pretty generalizable. And then another remaining question, this is uh, the last one. Is attention in film viewing more bottom up or stimulus driven than reading because of a few different things? One, Film has motion, okay? When you're reading, the text doesn't have any motion, okay? But in film, there's always motion, okay? And, and motion grabs attention, okay? And when you're watching a film, you don't usually view it at your own pace. In reading, you read at your own pace, usually. If you're reading a book, you, you decide when you're gonna go, or if you wanna look back, you can do that, or if you wanna continue. You make your, your own mind, but most people, when they watch a movie, they just watch it at the pace of the movie, okay? So we have shown that the event model, or understanding, does influence eye movements in picture stories. So we use picture stories, and then we uh, manipulated the understanding, and we uh, did that with inferences, and we showed that there was a big effect. Okay, so, and these have no motion because it's a picture story and viewing was self-paced. So what this suggests is that maybe movies have an especially high attentional control. And this goes back to that quote from Steven Spielberg where he was talking about 
he, how he loves it when he watches an audience watching a movie and their heads are going back, left, and right, all together at the same time, everybody knowing where to look at that time. So uh, maybe movies are special this way. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? <laughs>